load as Cubase on here, and I'll get straight right to the point. So last year on Twitter, I said I wanted to play Kingdom Hearts again and discuss it under the lens of metaphysics, either streaming it online or possibly even just make video edits out of it. But before I go into that, I want to discuss first why I want to talk about Kingdom Hearts under the metaphysical lens. And this is precisely the video about why. So the objectives of the video are as follows. Discuss what is ultimate reality and what cannot be. Why Christianity and why I use this to analyze stories. And why I use this in Kingdom Hearts. Disclaimer, I didn't study philosophy as a discipline, by the way, so there's bound to be errors in my observation and explanation. And it just came to fade back up again just a year ago. In this little manner, so I will have millions of mistakes on the doctrinal understanding of Christianity. I'm inserting the gaps for now and what I understood, so... Disclaimer. But first off, what is ultimate reality? According to Wikipedia, and I know Wikipedia isn't a good source about it, ultimate reality is something that is supreme, final, and fundamental power in all of reality. What does that mean? Well, take first fundamental. It means the following. At least according to Oxford Dictionary, I think. I think I got this from there. Serious and very important, affecting the most central and important parts of something. Or central, forming the necessary basis of something. And then add power in. Not the postmodernist sense of mere man dominating another, but what governs. And then add supreme, final, and ultimate to that understanding. Which means... What ultimate reality is, is what is that very, very underlying basis that governs our reality. With that said, it has to be eternal, right? Now consider this statement. It's something I've noticed with tragic Romans writers. They love to write. At least from the mangas I've read. They say this. Nothing lasts forever because things change. Well, they made already two mistakes there. If nothing lasts forever, there wouldn't be things changing. The first part is already even false because one, change is occurring forever, and two, there has to be things for there to be changed. Making it new things to last forever. First being change and second being things. Which means there is eternality already in our reality. There's actually three eternals of our reality. And the ones I mentioned before are the first two noticeable ones. So let me list the three eternals of our reality. One being eternal phenomena and two being eternal fundamentals. So one, change. Two, existence. And three, transcendence. So let's explain the three eternals of our reality. The first is change. So what is change? Based on the classical, so it is motion. Movement. That's basically it. It's movement from potentiality to actuality. Movement from one state to another. So there has to be something that exists first. Then transforms. That is change. It moves from one state to another. So first off, there has to be something where change has to occur, isn't it? And that's why I pointed out things before in that statement. And things are basically what exists. So the next up is existence. There will always be something that exists, and this is prior to change. It precedes change, because change cannot occur without things existing first. So existence is prior to change in terms of order. However, as mentioned before, change is a movement from one state to another. There has to be another state that is not yet made manifest, and yet there's potential for this existing thing to change, to transform to. Otherwise, existence by itself without this other cannot really be said that it really exists in a sense. I say it does exist. It is as if it doesn't, because there's no change occurring to it, more or less. My favorite uh, philosophy professor I follow says no, except for one. Well, that's something to talk about later. Anyway, so there has to be the other state in conjunction with what exists to say that it exists. And this other state is what I call transcendence. I'm going to be honest with you guys, I don't really get this one. At least the very nature of it. Hopefully I can understand this within my life journey, but well, here's what I'm getting for now. In some way, this is essence. What is this thing that exists really is and is on the act of becoming this by manifesting it outwardly, I think. I think, okay, that's just what I understood for now. So it's potentiality to actuality. But, it's, but essence is not within, so to speak, which I don't know if you guys are thinking like that, but that's what I thought before what essence meant, that it is something inside. That is not the case based on as far as I understood from Aristotle and uh, Plato. Well, but not like I actually read their works, I just read summaries for their works, from what I understood from those. What is inside is potentiality, but it cannot be understood in essence if that potentiality is not actualized. So another way of looking at transcendence aside from essence, well, think of this. Existence is on the act of manifesting this essence to be able to say that it exists. If that's the case, transcendence can also mean purpose. Ultimate purpose, so to speak. Its purpose is to manifest this essence. So, so in a sense, from what I understand, from my own reflections, that transcendence is purpose. The purpose is to manifest what is its essence, and that essence isn't really completely within. It also is beyond. Because when things attempt to manifest its essence, it's like you're trying to be something more than they are. But it's beyond. So I associate transcendence then with three points. First, that it is something more. Two, it is purpose. And three, essence. But you know, Sartre and other existentialists, people who say existence precedes everything, including essence, would give you the idea that 
essence, therefore, does not actually exist. But having existence as the first order. But defining existence again, existence cannot merely be an is, at least things within existence. Otherwise, it really doesn't exist, as I mentioned before. There has to be another state first again, since what allows that change to begin with is that other state, aka essence. And then rinse and repeat the problem again. I think it's actually the infant regress loop. I think. So to solve this, there has to be a terminal endpoint at the beginning at which both existence and transcendence coincide. Well, this is the unmoved mover, then. And the unmoved mover is God, more or less. Well, do note why I categorize change as a phenomena rather than fundamental, since change is a result of existence and transcendence, which means that both of them are prior to change, they precede change. And that means I don't really categorize God as changing, because he is what? Allow change, the agent of change. He is the one that, that is stable. Now, now, before we get to the argument that who created God first, First off, we go back to existence and transcendence again, and their eternality. Existence and transcendence then will always be there. So we go on to the second part of the first objective. So what is that which could not be? It is absolute nothingness. If true and absolute nothingness is a thing, then there would be nothing at all. Nothing would exist. Nothing changes. None. Except it's not true now, is it? There is something that exists. Otherwise, we wouldn't be here now. Since so the beginning, there was only God. Or at least what pagans understood. That there was Logos. A.K.A. the Tao, it, the natural law, moral law. It's still God, by the way. But it's understood as God, God unrevealed, I think that, that's, that, that's the word for it. I think I read the word before, it's called Agnostus Theos. God before revelation, I think. So who created God? When they say no one, it meant God has always existed. What was before God? When they say nothing, that actually means there was no one else but God, since nothing that's at its very core does not exist. Do you get where I'm getting at? What then is eternal? Existence, existence and transcendence. Unite them together, that's God. God has always been there, always will be. So there is something peculiar about things that exist, which is not God. The created, so to speak. If transcendence is what allows existence to eternally change, and so existence is eternal and all that, but what of the created? We don't feel that eternality now, do we? In some sense, there is that sort of nothing that does occur. Absolute nothingness is not, it's not though, it's not, since existence is eternal, but a seeming nothingness does seem to be a thing. What is the seeming nothing? If transcendence is that continuous play button that allows existence to continue on and on forever, that, which allows change, the seeming nothing is that stop button that puts what exists to a halt. So there is a sort of manifestation of the seeming nothingness towards what exists. The seeming nothingness, then, is probably what I call evil. Since, since the good is that continual generation of what exists, what has always, what has always been, and always will be, but that which should put things at the halt makes existence as if it's not moving against its nature of reaching towards transcendence, then I can't help but think that is what is evil. It puts it to stop. Well, put into basic practice, for example, would killing a person not be the same as that, that it's evil? Terminating them would put a halt to their existence, at least bodily existence. Although I'm not sure if you truly erase them from the face of reality. After all, existence and transcendence has always existed, but for bodily existence to render it unable to function as it is, what was it made to be, as though it does not exist? And is that not evil? If that is evil, then God is the good. Existence and transcendence together, the change is the result of it. So to sum it all up, there are three eternals of our reality. The first being an eternal phenomena, change, and the two others, the eternal fundamentals, existence and transcendence. The union of those latter two, Fundamentalist is basically God, Logos, Tao. The divine pattern, moral law, natural law. I think it's better to use moral law than natural law, though. It's the same thing. And this, the union of it is the good, the ultimate reality. And the one that could not be and does not exist is absolute nothingness. Its counterpart, the seeming nothingness, is basically, basically evil. By the way, that's all speaking in a more complex language, but in a personal sense, it also makes sense, at least to me. The simple language, it's like this. You're not a nothing, right? You exist, don't you? But in order to be recognized as if you truly existed, you have to do something. You have to reach out to something that's far beyond your current scope and manifest it to you, right? So to put it in simple terms, existence would be the current state and transcendence, as is the meaning of it, that it is of the beyond. It is that the something more. And it's through that reaching out for that something more, Transcendence, an attempt to embody transcendence, is what allows existence to be forever. Now, before I go into the next objective, I want to clarify first symbolisms. 
particularly the yin and yang symbol. So they're very much used in East Asian stories. Since I was already talking about good and evil before. I want to keep a note about it that yin and yang symbol is not about good and evil. Truly, what it really is, is the representation of the, the feminine and masculine principles, respectively. And I've mentioned it before, this is the symbol of the Tao, is it not? The Tao is good, right? The Tao is God. If this symbol represents masculine and feminine, and the Tao is basically God, that which has always existed and always will be, the generating principle of reality, then yin and yang symbol at its higher echelons refer to actual existence and transcendence, right? So now talking about the representations, the yin, the feminine principle, represents existence, and the yang, the masculine, transcendence. Why is that the case? At the very least, I think the feminine principle, the yin, basically being existence, is very fitting. It's because who is in charge of giving birth towards another existence? And from which this another existence is nurtured. Is it not a woman? So therefore, yin represents existence. Yang is represented by the masculine principle. But just like transcendence, when I define it, I also have a hard time understanding why this is the masculine input into ancient terms. At least in ancient terms. But it makes much more sense in modern explanation. Man's seed contains that genetic information that allows that change within a woman's body and ruin the function of generation. In other words, allows creation of a new existence. That creation continuous, so to speak, that reflects that divine it reflects God. It reflects the Tao. Well, maybe the ancients understood this in a primeval manner, I guess. <laughs> so yes, yin and yang refers to existence and transcendence respectively, more or less. And the evil, and that evil, is not in the picture. What is evil yet? Nothingness. Which means, in this sense of the divine, it cannot exist in that picture. It's an error to associate yin with evil. You run into actually equivocating that existence itself is evil, and therefore concluding the bearers of existence, women, as evil. Now, do you think women are evil? Hmm. I don't think so. I'm a woman, I don't think I'm evil. <laughs> Although there's actually a basis as to why yin is falsely associated with evil. Because like I said before, existence by itself without transcendence, it would seem like as if it doesn't exist. Like it's a nothing. A seeming nothing. Now the difference is that evil is a deliberate turning into nothingness. Existence by itself is not. That's why existence, the yin, is often falsely associated with evil. It's false because it always existed, unlike the actual nothing which doesn't exist. So no yin is not evil, it is the feminine principle. Existence. It isn't good by itself either. It's the union with transcendence that makes the both of them good. And it's not to say transcendence by itself is good alone <laughs> either. It's pathetic if it's alone. It's merely form, not manifest. That's why the union of transcendence and existence is the good. Which really puts me back to what I say that the yin and yang isn't good and evil. It is solely the good. Basically, the yin and yang is divine pattern. There is that something more and that what exists reaches out for that something more and brings it down to them like a cycle. This is why yin is also often associated poetically with earth and yang the heavens. The heavens seeded the earth just as man to a woman and gave birth to all that exists. So yes, whenever you hear heaven and earth, both poetically and religiously, they oftentimes refer to that divine pattern. Jonathan Pajot actually has a good diagram about this. Any symbols that refers to man and women, and even using man and women themselves as symbols, especially in religious context, really refers to the attributes of, if not attributes, then existence and transcendence themselves, and their relational qualities together. Like chaos and order, for example. People don't like chaos, but it's not like order is perfect either, at least the order that man builds. This chaos occurs because it puts that imperfect order crashing down that served its time. And then from there, as if like birth banks, the birth of a new order arises. And these symbols, the fact that we can put them differently and still refer to that relation between existence and transcendence means that this really reverberates through reality. There's a universal sense to it. This divine pattern. It's a pattern that reverberates throughout existence. Anyway, yin and yang symbols is actually my second favorite. My most favorite right now is the cross. Yes, the Christian cross. So we go on to the second objective. So why Christianity to interpret the stories? To note, I'm not a Protestant, which means I don't memorize my Bible. I'm not biblically based. But I'm trying my best reading the Bible now, so. <laughs> so the Gospels, and that's the only ones I've read so far. I didn't actually read the Old Testament yet. I skipped out. No, don't expect much from me regarding the Bible other than the generalizations of it. So why Christianity? Well, first off, I grew up in a Catholic environment, so there's that. Which means my view of the world is very much colored under the lens of Christianity. The second thing is, in a historical perspective, no matter how much people don't like hearing this, by the way, the world as it is up to right now is actually under the Christian rule. The dignity of the individual, human rights, and all that. Where do you think that came from? Cicero's great contemporary Caesar is, by some accounts, slaughtering a million Gauls and enslaving another million 
in the cause of, of boosting his political career. And far from feeling in any way embarrassed about this, he's kind of promoting it. And yeah. so when he holds his triumph, people are going through the streets of Rome carrying billboards, boasting about how many people he's killed. And this is this is a really terrifyingly alien world. And the more you look at it, the more you realize that it is built on systematic exploitation. Mm-hmm. Um, so the entire economy is founded on slave labor right the the sexual economy is founded on the absolute right of free roman males to have sex with anyone that they want any way that they like mm. and in almost every way this is a world that is unspeakably cruel to our way of thinking mm. and so this worried me more and more <laughs> and it was kind of like i was thinking well you know where I, I'm clearly not, as I'd vaguely imagined, the heir of the Greeks and the Romans in any way, really. As Tom Wright was saying, you know, this is not a very lengthy amount of writing, but compacted into this very, very small amount of writing was almost everything that explains the modern world. Well, the Western world, as we take for granted. Yeah. Yes, but also the way that the West has then moved on to shape you know concepts like international law for instance so the 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 the, the, the fact the ba- you know concepts of human rights all these kind of things ultimately they don't go back to greek philosophers they don't go back to roman imperialism they re- they go back to paul Some and of pa- the humanists paul really and atheists, is, you know I, his letters his yeah. letters i think are along with the the the, the, the four gospels the most influential the most impactful the most revolutionary writings that have emerged from you, you, the edge. So that was that. Even Greek philosophers and Roman philosophers were able to identify metaphysics, the law. And yet, you don't really hear any moral advancements from them that Christianity has brought. Best they reveal to us there is order, divine order. That is the Tao, the Logos, natural law, basically the moral law, and that you must follow through it. Otherwise, you perish. Precisely because of that, strict hierarchies are formed. Because that's how man is by ourselves understood what divine order is. Where do you think being forever stuck in the case came from? It's an attempt to pattern ourselves to ultimate reality, regarding its eternality at the same time order. So by understanding existence and transcendence as divine pattern that we must align to lest we perish, it did seem like humanity, historically, had a bump into a problem regarding how to integrate that. And obviously the way mankind understood how to retain existence is to act in a collective manner, and follow that strict, unforgiving hierarchy. How else would you survive? Transcendence, while it is known from what I understood from history 2, even pagan, no, there is that. But pagan humanity didn't understand what really is transcendence, just like me. What is essence? What is our purpose? What is beyond? They just know there is essence, but what it really is, just like me right now, they don't fully comprehend it. And Christianity gave an answer. They gave the answer that what is transcendent is personhood, that what is binding is it love between persons. That is what is eternal. That's why the individual is given dignity, because human individuals are persons. They are the ones patterned like God. God is person, and it's not the collective. It's even under Christian doctrines that men and women are created under the image of God. And then the fact that they have affirmed that God had become man by way of m- woman, through that, they also had affirmed the divinity of mankind by going through and incarnating through the particulars, hence the valuing of the individual. And then lastly, bringing up the topic of life and death, there is that understanding across all human cultures, obviously, since we all experience it, that things become indeed a sort of nothing, as I've mentioned before. This is very much a reality, and that's because we experience death. That life ultimately in the end means nothing. Even if there is the understanding of eternality of the universe, even among pagans, it still means nothing to the individual who cannot be eternal. So you can tell that plenty of them ended up in resignation. Stoicism system was a sort of resignation. They understand there is Logos, but what does it mean to someone? We don't know. We don't know what Logos means to an individual. But this definitely is a resignation philosophy. Well, it is a resignation philosophy, but more precisely an atheistic philosophy. After all, it ultimately ended up rejecting Brahman and Atman. Both the universal in particular. It's basically rejecting God then. And they desire to escape this through becoming a nothing. It's a resignation. So why do you think former nations who had peak understanding of ultimate reality, like the Taoists and some Hindus, obviously Buddhism came from the understanding of Hinduism. Why do you think they were able to integrate them well with their existing precepts regarding ultimate reality and have become widespread in the regions? Because it does remain the same whatever man does alone. Come on, just like Stoicism. Hence the symbol of the circle that represents what ancients understood. This is, by the way, I mentioned by Gilbert Chesterton, that all is trapped under the cycle of life and death. Basically means existence and meaningless is our end. Shant gives again an answer and a solution. The answer that man alone cannot save himself. He cannot be enlightened on his own. 
the solution. Somebody has to like it. <laughs> and the one to like the way is God himself. He has showed the way that he is not the God of death, the God of nothing, but the God of eternal life, eternal existence. And he showed it through Christ by becoming just like man and experienced life and death, just like man. The resurrection lets us know that the nothingness, the ultimate nothingness to man, is defeated. There's so many things about Christianity, actually, that really change the world. As if the force around it, it truly is the prime mover. Like I said, the ancients thought of the world before. It was a cyclical pattern. You cannot break. As if, through that, nothing had changed. But through the advent of Christ, things had changed. It truly feels as if Christ really is God. Because God is the prime mover. That the universal has become the particular and showed us what is truly his way. Not just the changes to very revealing, by the way, but even in depth, there's so many symbolic layers in the story of Christ. I don't even know where to begin with. That is why the symbol of the cross for me surpasses the symbol of the Tao. The horizontal line refers to what exists, but it's all in what is understood referring to existence. And the vertical line is what is beyond, what stands out, what is transcendent. And they intersect as opposed to the forever chasing of the yin and yang, which can never melt completely and trap forever in a circle. The cross precisely breaks the pattern. The cross intersects and breaks the circle. Paraphrasing Gilbert Chesterton again, that was the state of the rest of the pagan world stuck in. Including the western world, by the way, he admits that. As if repeating forever the same cyclical pattern. And through the cross, life, death, and resurrection, the cycle was broken. What is transcendent had entered what has existed and gave birth anew. That's why I'm using Christianity to interpret stories. It is mankind's ultimate standard as of now. There's nothing else. Also, give me two cents, by the way, why Christianity refers to God as He instead of something like the Tao, like it's a law. Because, first off, it keeps intact that divine revelation. Because, like I said, I don't think pagans understood what really was transcendent before. And that divine revelation revealed to us that what is transcendent is personhood. Therefore, God, the transcendent, has to be person as well. So, He must be referred as if He is person, which in fact He is. But why He, not she? Like I pointed out earlier, that transcendence is a masculine principle. I don't know how Protestants does their church, but the way Catholics do it is that they refer to the church as the she of the relationship. And the capital C, church, isn't a mere building, by the way. It refers to the people under Christ. So mankind is the she of the relationship under Christ. God is the he. So again, referring to that divine pattern that constitutes ultimate reality. All that exists is she, while the transcendent is he. So on to the third objective. Now, why use those three, metaphysics, religion, and Christianity, to interpret Kingdom Hearts? I've been having these weird thoughts lately. Like, is any of this for real? Or not? You feel nothing. Nothing is real. I can give you purpose. So it's true. You really are his nobody. Guess Diz was right after all. What are you talking about? I am me! Nobody else! <laughs> because I'm you. No, I'm me. I'm me, he says. Must be nice being real. A fake like me could never get away with saying that. This world is full of light. It's a world comprised of many smaller worlds, all connected, stretching as far as the eye can see. One great light protects us all throughout this vast land. All worlds share one light, one fate. I take it you're talking about Kingdom Hearts. Supreme Darkness! You're wrong. I know now, without a doubt, Kingdom Hearts is light! Uh-huh. So actually, its in-universe propositions of what constitutes the reality is pretty much reflective of how metaphysics is put into a fantasy story. The story of Kingdom Hearts basically asks about what is existence. It talks about nothingness. It talks about whether copies are real. It asks what really is ultimately real. That is even Sora's intro line. Is any of this real or not? The story is asking what is ultimate reality. Not to mention the way characters describe what Kingdom Hearts is. It's basically what is God. Yes, Kingdom Hearts is a reference to God. It's no coincidence that the moral loves using Latin and those heavenly symbols to refer to his cast of heroes, while satanic symbols to refer to his villains. And there's also the Christian reference of the seven sins among the foretellers' names. It's hard to see this as a coincidence at all. 
I don't know if Nomura is actually aware of what he's doing. Whether subconsciously or consciously that he's using this. Maybe he's secretly a Christian. I don't know. A lot of Kingdom Hearts actually talks about metaphysics. And religion. That is worth discussing. With that said, let's play Kingdom Hearts! Also, this serves as my review again. You know, for the next Kingdom Hearts games. So here goes. <laughs>